The following is a fictional story of events that may happen in the near future. 8 a.m. New York Stock Exchange. It's a cold, breezy day on Wall Street as markets await the Federal Reserve's announcement for QE4. Futures are up significantly. The Dow Jones just breached its 2008 high of 14,164. Gold just at an all-time high of 2,900. Silver just breached $100 per ounce. The dollar index is holding at 53. With official unemployment at 16.3%, there's a nervous feeling on Wall Street that if this doesn't work, the world could implode into a depression that will last for the remainder of the decade. 8.19 a.m. Beijing. Chinese officials announced that they can no longer allow Washington to devalue their holdings. After making their concerns private, China accepts that Washington will never stop paying its debts with inflated currency. China makes an official statement from Beijing, quote, We have made our concerns known privately for some time. With QE4 about to be announced today, China will have no choice but to stop purchasing U.S. Treasuries. We have allowed Washington to try to work through their imbalances for four years. But with global inflation and U.S. consumers rapidly shrinking as a percentage of global GDP, we feel that a Western recovery is unlikely until they reform their entitlement programs. 8.45 a.m. New York Stock Exchange. Upon hearing the statement from China, Dow futures have a sharp reversal and begin to drop. Gold leaps past $3,000 per ounce, up $150 per ounce in the last 26 minutes. CNBC awaits a statement from the White House. 8.50 a.m. Washington, D.C. The president makes an official statement to calm investors' fears. He tells Americans that he has spoken with several G20 leaders. They have assured him that they will continue to increase their purchase of treasuries and believe that a strong U.S. economy is the only thing that will bring back global prosperity. He has also spoken to Chairman Bernanke who assures him that a strong dollar will be the result of QE4. The President also reminds Americans that his recent New Deal recovery programs that he passed through executive order will increase the likelihood of a lasting recovery. He also notes that Beijing, since 2009, has slowly been reducing their holdings, so the impact will be minimal. 9.51 a.m. New York. Dow futures fall 850 points in the first 20 minutes of trading. Markets are halted for one hour by the authorities. 10 a.m. Main Street, America. The news about the stock market in China has now spread. A panic begins to sit in and unprepared Americans rush to the grocery store. In an attempt to purchase food and water, Americans that didn't know what was going on are alerted by all of the news stories and panic buying. Within 50 minutes, there is a nationwide rush to the stores. Empty store shelves in America become a reality. 10.52 a.m. New York. Markets reopen and the Dow Jones resumes its collapse. Investors around the world join the sell-off in bonds and stocks and begin to purchase commodities. Unlike the panic of 2008, this time commodities are seen as the only safe haven from a dollar crisis. 11.30 a.m. New York. The Dow falls 1,700 points since reopening. Trading is halted for at least two hours. The Federal Reserve injects $200 billion into the markets and announces that QE4 will be delayed until further notice. Congress is called back to D.C. for an emergency joint session. Some members of Congress are saying that they consider China's statement a financial attack. 12 p.m. Main Street, America. Several cities begin to see civil unrest after grocery stores are forced to close. Traffic in the streets and violence break out. The president puts the National Guard on alert for a possible deployment onto U.S. streets if things don't get under control soon. Several news agencies are reporting injuries at grocery chains and call for the authorities to do something before it gets worse. 12.15 p.m. Toronto, Canada. George Soros tells CNBC that a run on treasuries is imminent and that there is nothing the government can do to stop it. He says it is unfortunate that a controlled decline of the dollar was not coordinated better over the years. Today really could have been avoided if not for the Tea Party politicians who demanded fiscal responsibility and a constitutional government. 3 p.m. Gold closes at 11.53 for the day at $4,053 per ounce. Silver closes at $173 per ounce. The president announces that due to civil unrest in some areas of the country, U.S. stock markets will remain closed for the rest of the day. 
with the exception of mining and other inflation related stocks, the majority of US stocks are down significantly due to the sell off and flight to safety in commodities. The Federal Reserve announces that it will begin to purchase U.S. Treasuries and stocks in order to stabilize the markets. But this only feeds investors' fears of a full-blown Treasury run and collapse of the dollar. 6 p.m. Asia. Asian markets begin a massive sell-off. Dollar collapse rumors begin to take hold of the markets. CNBC Asia looks into a possible COMEX default and complete breakdown in the U.S. economy. Gold spikes in Asia, up 17.50 in the first complete hour of trading. Gold is now at 58.03. 7 p.m., gold and silver bullion dealers across the world have suspended all sales due to no inventory. A COMEX default is now expected. Several central bank representatives propose a freeze on currency markets and a fixed devaluation of the U.S. dollar in order to calm investors. 7.30 p.m. The United States. The sun sets on America. In the last 12 hours, the world has changed. Americans are glued to their televisions, taking a crash course on a debauched currency. Smoke from fires in the cities have put a dark cloud over the nation. 7.45, the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve announces it will inject $1.5 trillion into the markets in order to stop any further decline in stocks. 7.55 p.m., OPEC. The final nail in the coffin. OPEC nations halt oil trades in U.S. dollars until further notice. They will only accept euros, renminbi, or gold. 7.59 p.m., the Federal Reserve's announcement to inject $1.5 trillion into the markets causes a sharp reversal in overseas markets. Stocks begin to rally even as Main Street melts down. 8 p.m. Manhattan. Gerard Adams, president of the National Inflation Association, sends out an urgent email alert. In it, he informs members that it is with great sadness that the time to warn and prepare Americans for hyperinflation has ended. In this case of BP, it asked the state of Louisiana if it could drill in 500 feet of water, and Louisiana said it could. The federal government vetoed that and told BP it could only drill in 5,000 feet of water. Never mind that no oil company had ever cleaned up a broken well at that depth. And never mind that the feds had never monitored a broken well at that depth. And never mind that BP only needed to set aside 75 million in case something went wrong. The feds trumped BP engineers, and the feds trumped the wishes of the folks who live along the Gulf Coast, and the feds decided where this oil well would be drilled. When government says they are starting a new program under the guise of helping its citizens, it may sound well and good on the surface when presented positively by the mainstream media. But this government misallocation of money and resources always leads to unintended consequences. Let's start by taking a look at one recent government action that was positively portrayed by the mainstream media. Cash for clunkers. A $3 billion federal program intended to give consumers incentive to trade in older, less fuel-efficient vehicles for more fuel-efficient vehicles. The federal government felt that this would both stimulate the economy as well as reduce the nation's long-term carbon emissions. Every vehicle qualifies. Going on now until the money runs out. It's cash for clunkers. The government talking points that the news media reported were full of cheerful results. An opportunity for both consumers and car dealers at a time when the industry needs it the most. New dealerships saw sales spike. The average trade-in saw a 61% increase in fuel efficiency. And the Cash for Clunkers program stimulated the economy. The unintended consequences that were not reported. The vast majority of trade-ins were paid off. But after the trade-in, the majority of new vehicles that were purchased were financed or leased. So Americans literally destroyed assets in order to exchange them for debt. The clunkers were destroyed, never reaching the full cycle of life of a vehicle. Instead of being purchased at an auction to be resold at a used dealership or purchased by a low-income individual, the vehicles were destroyed. The engines that have been disabled with the sodium silicate product are not able to be reused. 
Auto price inflation entered the secondary market where clunkers were in low supply but constant demand. San Diego, California. Police officers have reported an increase in theft for older vehicles in order to sell the parts. Parts that would have made it on the market honestly if not for the Cash for Clunkers program. Used auto dealers reported across the nation that not only were there less vehicles to purchase at auctions during the program, but sales were hurt due to the government's stimulated demand for new vehicles only. Mechanics who make a living off of repairing and servicing vehicles certainly will have less to work on as consumers not only destroyed their vehicles, but we're now driving new ones. Once dealers disable the engine, that cuts the car's value at the salvage yard. We lose at least 50% right off the top, if not all of it. I can get just as much money out of this motor and trans as I can for the body parts. It's if that not valuable. more, yeah. It's that valuable. When you're left with a car minus the motor, you lose money right off the bat. Charitable organizations noted that the program hurt their revenues, causing them to not be able to fund programs. Looking at auto sales, we can see the cash for clunkers simply took away from future purchases, causing a depressed market for the months to follow. The rebate checks were given out on borrowed money that will have to be paid back with taxes, reducing the purchasing power today of all taxpayers, and in the future, through inflation. The politicians concerned about global warming did not consider the carbon emissions that it would take to not only move the clunkers, but to remove and transport the toxic waste of coolant, gasoline, oil, and other items in the engine. A study was done by Duke University that found it took 3 to 12 tons of carbon dioxide just to create a new car. According to Duke, trucks that were purchased would need to be driven for 9 years in order to offset the clunker to new truck trade-in. According to Edmunds.com, the program actually cost taxpayers money. $24,000 per vehicle, not $4,000 that the government estimated. Out of the 690,000 purchases, only 125,000 would not have been made without the incentive of the rebate. One question that our politicians may never know is that if people did purchase a vehicle because of government help, if they are spending money on new debt because of government policy, have any of the Keynesian policymakers considered that they aren't spending money on something else? What would that monthly payment have gone towards? What part of the economy could have been naturally stimulated because of individual choice? Those industries will never know. These are just some of the unintended consequences of what happens when government wants to help. Now let's take a look at all government spending. What if we were to say that all government spending is inflationary? That's right, all government spending. As noted many times by Representative Dr. Ron Paul, government spending causes an inflation tax. I would get rid of the inflation tax. It's a tax that nobody talks about. Mr. Bernanke admitted that he conceded that inflation was a tax. Every time we see the cost of living going up, that we indirectly are paying a tax. Congressman, I, I couldn't agree with you more that inflation is a tax. Inflation is a tax. What would happen if FHA, Fannie, Freddie, mortgage deductions, and all government interference in the housing market was eliminated. Even Keynesians will admit the housing market would collapse, or the way we look at it, housing would finally find its natural equilibrium that is sustainable by natural supply and demand. Simply put, government spending causes house inflation. Foreign wars making the world safe for democracy. Nothing is more inflationary than war, producing products in order to destroy them not to mention what the CIA refers to as blowback. That's when the survivors of collateral damage grow up to be, you know, evil doers. College tuition has seen a constant rise since government got involved. The government has created the worst type of demand for our colleges. The cost of behavior has been eliminated. Colleges today can raise prices without the concern of pricing out students because they know that the government will provide the money. What about regulations? and all the employees that enforce them, certainly they are helping the economy. Regulations force businesses to spend more on not doing business, not hiring, and not creating new services or products. Regulations, however, are priced into your health insurance, shoes, clothing, food, cars, homes, and pretty much anything you buy, causing prices to have a stealth regulation tax. Failure, however, is free and is also just. If a business charges too much or angers consumers, it will inevitably fail without regulations. 
However, with regulators like the Federal Reserve and the FDIC, we have recently seen that sometimes it's the regulator who keeps bad businesses in business. Or how about the Department of Energy? Their objective is to end our dependence on foreign oil. Since the creation of the Energy Department, foreign oil dependence has risen from roughly 50% to 70%. And when it comes to all their noble green energy regulations, the Department of Energy failed its own EPA audit in 2009. And then of course we have government insanity. Washington recently spent $2.6 million to train Chinese prostitutes to drink more responsibly. Road signs costing $300 each are being placed at construction sites to alert motorists that their tax dollars are being spent. And the U.S. Forest Service is spending $554,000 to replace broken windows at a Mount St. Helens visitor center that has been closed since 2007, and they have no plans on reopening it. According to the GAO, duplication programs have run amok in Washington with 342 economic development programs, 75 programs funding international education, and 72 safe water programs, all with the same duplicate objections. The GAO also classified nearly half of all purchases on government credit cards as improper, fraudulent, or embezzled. What's improper? iPods, Xboxes, jewelry, liquor, mortgage payments, gambling, internet dating services, and vacations. Did we mention that government workers make more than the private sector? Good thing they have the tax dollars to go to the Ritz-Carlton to look at government waste. Government spending causes an increased demand, waste, fraud, and price inflation. Please, the next time someone asks the government for a solution, consider the consequences. Some time ago, back in 2005, of course, when a lot of uh, Americans were asleep, you know, they were too busy enjoying prosperity and watching uh, TV and, and wondering if the Dallas Cowboys were going to beat the Pittsburgh Steelers or not. Um, our, our government was busy trying to nationalize an ID for everybody here um, in America. And I have a, another news source here, and this is the headline. Let me put it up there. You see what it says? In less than 90 days, you will be required by federal law to carry a national ID card. Now, this is where we start getting to the point right here where we, we're heading towards what um, the Bible calls the mark of the beast, or what people have coined as. I'm going to read this article here it's in, in its entirety to let you know that these people in office today, they, th these so-called elected officials and representatives, they have no plans whatsoever at all to keep you informed about anything that's going on. They want to pass all this stuff, and then they want to send the Gestapo uh, police force out um, to murder and kill you if necessary, uh, in case you don't comply with their acts, uh, because they passed their laws. And it's something, but I'm going to read this article in its entirety, because it's, it's important for you to know this. Now listen to it real close. Even though no one on the Capitol Hill is talking about it, unless it is stopped, the provisions of the Real ID Act of 2005, public law, 109-13-119-STAT-392 through the Department of Homeland Security will require the federalization of state-issued driver's license by May 11, 2011. This is the type of card that Nazis and the Communists in the Soviet Union made people carry. The new car is disguised as the Uniform Driver's License with a biometric, um, um, each card will store up to a gigabyte of personal data about the card holder and will contain a GPS tracking chip. So that means that the government will know everywhere you are at all times. No one is talking about this and certainly this is something that the Obama administration would like to keep quiet. You hear that? They like to keep quiet. Nobody would like to get this particular message out. That's the reason why I'm talking about it here today. Elder Douglas Becker here, um, he brought this to my attention this morning, and I finally got to it to be able to download it and then read this article and now present it to you in hopes 
that you would wake up and also spread this around quick, fast, in a hurry over the internet. Um, Barack Obama's America is quickly becoming Nazi Germany. Did you ever think you would experience invasion? Big Brother tactics um, in which uniform officers ask, let me see your papers. That is your papers. Let me see your papers. I know Barack Obama doesn't care what the U.S. Constitution says, so we have to care and we have to stop him. If this battle is not waged and won by May 11th, 2011, listen to me real close, May 11th, 2011, the American people will be carrying a federal ID card that will double as a state issues driver's license. You will need it to vote. You will need it to enter any federal building. You will need it to buy uh, a plane ticket. And believe it or not, you will need it if you are stopped while jogging in the park or sitting on your front porch. Oh, yes. And because it will be your driver's license as well, you will need it to drive your car. You may be wondering how in the world uh, we could have allowed this to happen. We allowed it to happen because we are more concerned about terrorists, you know, which is, um, well, I wonder who that enemy is when they keep talking about terrorism. I mean, he seems to have no face, uh, no nation. Um, I wonder who he is. But anyway, uh, we're more concerned about terrorists than civil liberties. Congress has passed the Real ID Act on May 11, 2005, creating a mandatory national standard for state-issued driver license, making the data points identical on all cards. Real ID requires state driver's license authorities to use more stringent measures to verify social security numbers, birth dates, addresses, and proof of citizenship. And immigration status, the act prescribes 18 separately security controls that states are now required to use when issuing driver's license. But the Real ID Act can be issued. The applicant must provide the following documentation. Number one, a photo ID that includes his or her full legal or birth name and birth date. Documentation of birth date, i.e. your birth certificate. Documentation of legal status and social security number. Third party documentation showing name and place of residence. Now, what happened was is that the American public raised so big of an outcry when this thing came out. They did say that they were going to come back with this again in 2011 and some of us are asleep and didn't think it was going to happen now, we're far removed from 2006, and we're here in 2011 now, and we're only a few months away from them boogers trying to pass this act right here. Pass this word around, and pass it around real fast. Get YouTube smoking.